I went down across the street, sat in my building, the first plane hit. Wow. Everybody from breakfast was gone, <sighs> you know, so I lost a lot of people. And what people don't know, one of the biggest secrets about 9-11 is that... Sitting down with David Greenberg was an incredible opportunity. I learned so much from his perspective on life. This is a guy that grew up on Long Island, was taught by his father how to trade, ended up on the NYMEX trading oil in the pit like crazy, people punching each other in the face, like the 80s, the 90s, the like screaming, trading oil across the globe. He helped took the NYMEX from 800 million to $12 billion. He was there on the day in the Twin Towers at 9-11. And he is someone who has realized that you can't buy happiness. He has seen it all, he's had it all, he's built it all. And now he's taking all of his lessons and he's helping other people realize how to be happy and how to get everything that they want in life. And, and this was just an incredible conversation. I learned so much from him and I know you will too. Let me know in the comments what you think was the most powerful part of David's story and I'll reply. We, we were like no other business in the world. I mean, it was literally you know, like going to the Super Bowl every day. And my class is what I do, and I did it last night at NYU, is that I get the kids up and I explain to them that the first point of leadership and the first point of being successful is being heard. Mm -hmm. And so many people are too afraid to hear their own voice. So what I do is I get the kids up in class and when I do these uh, you know, speaking engagements, I mean, I've done it to a thousand people and I get them up and I have them all go scream out, buy them. And then I have them scream out sold. And then I break them up and they all start screaming buy them sold as loud as they can. And I keep them going, 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 and I cut them off. And I'm like, feel your heartbeat. You know, and they're all just like pumping through. And I'm like, it was like going to the Super Bowl every day at work. Being on the NYMEX trading floor and trading oil during the Gulf Wars and during Katrina and during all the storms, there was no other business. It was like being on a pro team every day. You know, so I try to get that instilled in the younger people and mm. the people that I coach simply because if you can't be vocal and if you can't be heard, you could be the smartest person anywhere and it doesn't make a difference. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I agree. Right. Like even from today now, it's different. Uh, there's social media. We're doing a podcast or sure. content. You have the ability to, to have a voice anywhere at any point in time. But if you're not participating and not willing to, to put it out there. Well, it's like my nephew's a, a former army ranger, and he's so fun. I'm like, hey, I want you to come. I want you to speak to some of my people. He's like, David, no, I'm too afraid. And I'm like, what are you talking about? You were in Afghanistan. You were in special missions. It was a joint task force with you and the SEALs. He goes, that. He goes, David, he goes, he goes that's just people shooting at me. I'm like, yeah. And he goes, like, this public speaking scares the hell out of me. Wow. And it's amazing. And he said that's how most people look at public speaking, that right. they just think that the whole world's looking at them. And from my time at CNBC, when you knew and Fox and everything else, when there were hundreds of thousands of people, just just go with it, you know. If you screw up, nobody cares, right? You right. Know? So just get it out there. Yeah, I, w I mean, do you do for anybody that you, that has that problem? Do you have any advice for how do you get over that fear of being in the public eye? Well, the way that I talk to people about getting over any fear, whether it's the public eye, whether it be doing the deal, whether it be being out there, and I coach a lot of athletes, you know, like this. I go, there is being on the trading floor. You know, you, you get into the, into the room, which is a 25,000 square foot, 40-foot ceilings, and we'd bring it down to like 60 degrees in the morning because mm -hmm. there were 2,000 people in there. And you get your spot in the ring, and we can talk about how you get in that spot in your ring, but you stay there. It's not like the stock market was completely different. You, mm -hmm. you had to be in your area. And before that bell would ring, it would be, you know, and back then is when crude oil opened up at 10 o'clock. So it would be like 9.59, 30 seconds, 9.59, 45 seconds, 9.59, 55 seconds, and boom, 10 o'clock, the bell hits. And you went from being scared out of your mind, because I only traded my own money, mm. to reacting. And what I try to explain to people is there is a very fine line between being scared and nervous and being excited. And if you can understand that and you can cross that line and realize it's okay to be scared, use the, use the adrenaline rush to your favor. Mm. It's okay to be nervous. I'm nervous. I was nervous every day before that belt. I was ready to throw up because I'm trading my own money. I know that first trade, either I'm down or up, and it's going to make you know what the plan is for the rest of the day. But we, I got very good at taking that adrenaline rush of being scared crapless and turning it into immediate excitement. And I've had athletes do that. I've had business people do that. And it's amazing to see how it changes their whole life outlook because then they're not afraid to be afraid anymore. Mm. It's okay to be afraid. Right. If you're not afraid, you're, you're psychotic, okay, right? <laughs> okay, but don't let that fear paralyze you. Live off that fear, feed off that fear. Make that fear come to your aid at the best times. 
and it, you'll see it'll take you to heights that you never knew that you could do. That's I love that. That's amazing. I I think it's so powerful too, right? Because it's it's yeah. We, we all fe- we all feel fear. Sure. But we, it's that being scared of that feeling is bigger problem. I than love the actual it. People fear. used to say to me, "Why do you love live television?" And I I literally I loved live TV. Mm. And I said it because I knew if I screwed up, everybody saw it. And they're like, "Well, doesn't that scare the crap?" And I'm like, "Yeah, but it was mm. an awesome. It was a rush." You know, being a trader on the floor, you lived for the rushes. So yeah. It was it was interesting when I stopped trading. Um, I went through a long period of depression, and I finally went to a therapist, and they said, well, you're going through withdrawal. Wow. So I'm like, I didn't do drugs. They go, no, no. He goes, when you were screaming and yelling, he goes, if you ever go to a baseball game or, a, let's say, a basketball game, and they take that last second shot, and it goes in, and everybody's, yes, you know, that feeling that you get, and yeah. then you are just pumped. He says, well, you were getting that nine times a day, even wow. on your good trades or bad trades. He goes, and then it went to nothing, because those are all dopamine fixes. Wow. And I didn't realize that, you know, that the dopamine fixes just ended. And you had a whole bunch of people out there when you'd meet these traders, it was like the, the land of the walking dead. Because wow. we were all missing something. Huh. So, yeah, so it was, it was, it was awesome, you know. That's unbelievable. T- tell, me, tell me about, what's, what's your biggest high from trading that you, that, that you can think of? Well, there's, there's a couple of them, you know. First of all, when you get into the pit, it would be so tight during the Gulf War sometimes that you literally pick up your legs. Because, you know, it wasn't like the stock market where people walk over and they tap you on the shoulder. This was bodies flying, spit going everywhere. You know, I broke my nose one time from somebody's elbow coming back into me, you know, blacked out in the pit. Um, But there were so many, so many great highs being listened. One, the only high I was ever speechless was the high that we went when on our day of the IPO. Mm. And that had nothing to do with our trading. But we were, we were supposed to open it up at 59. And it was so funny because you just had Pinterest and you just had Zoom. And I was living through their, you know, expectations. And we were priced at 59. And I'm on, the, I'm on the stock exchange floor at that time. And I'm watching the chairman and some other people. And I'm like, well, there's no offers. So I'm like, oh, okay. So that's 70 bid, no offers. 80 bid, no offers. 90 bid, no offers. 100 bid, no offers. 110 bid, no offers. 120 bid, no offers. Our heart, first prints like 125, 130. So we thought we were going to come out of 59. We kept priced out at 130. I literally couldn't speak for the rest of the day because I was just in awe. Okay. Cause for the, anybody the, that doesn't understand what that means, what, 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 put that in context. Well, let's of, put it this way. If you thought you were going to make $1, you made two on every $1 you're mm-hmm. going to make. And it was a very, you know, as a trader and as a seed owner, we had very large amounts of shares. Yep. And it was, it, was, it was a life-altering moment, wow. you know. Not making you happier because of the money, but definitely it changes, you know, it changes your perspective. But every day was a rush, you know. Mm-hmm. I mean, listen, do you have kids? I have a daughter. She's six okay, months old. There's your biggest rush. Yep. Okay. You yep. know, I always say you thought you had rushes, but when that when the kid's born and if you have another one, those two biggest rushes are the best rushes of your life. Anything after that just doesn't matter. Yeah. Okay. But it's nice to have. Well, what what's the what was the biggest low in the in the pit? I remember it was amazing. I remember that I was a new trader. And I went home long, what we called seven contracts, seven lots, 7,000 barrels, which is not really a big deal. And the Gulf War breaks out that night. And I was a cocky little kid, and I knew that I was up about 50,000 on the trade. And because, you know, it was, there was no overnight trading for us at that time, but we heard in the aftermarket that the market was up. And so I go to the car dealer, the Mitsubishi car dealer, and I'm like, I'm going to come in, I'm going to buy that car tomorrow. So the guy looks at me, I was a 20-something-year-old kid, I'm cocky, he's like, sure. Okay, so I go back home, and my uncle, who was working for a big firm that could trade the overnight market, calls me up and goes, David, you know, because Saddam Hussein was saying this is going to be the mother of all battles, and mm. everybody was worried about the oil fields and everything. He's like, David, my company's trying to sell everything we can, $7 higher. I'm like, oh. Then he calls me up and goes, David, we're trying to sell everything we can, $5 higher. Then when she calls me up, we're trying to sell everything at unchanged you know, which is, means the market didn't move anywhere. And I'm like, don't call me back for the rest of the night. So when I got back to the trading floor, mm-hmm. the next day when we opened, we went from being $7 higher to opening up $8 lower. So I went from being up 50000 as a new trader to my account going negative oh. that morning because I lost 60 or something. Wow. And simply because, you know, the interesting thing was, and, and people didn't realize this, is that once we, the, the world realized that Saddam couldn't get a plane off the ground, the oil, the Saudi oil fields were never at risk. So it took all the risk out of the market. Mm. So here it was, I went from hero to zero, you know, and I remember walking into my boss's office and he looked at me and says, and this was great, and um, he says, this is not a career ending day. 
you know, just got caught on the wrong side. And it turned out I had done some of what we called spreads that I forgot about that came in, so I ended up making like half of it back. But he says, I want you to go home, forget about this day, shake it off, come back in three days and come start trading again. Mm. You know, what I talk about a lot in my lectures and my clients is how to recover after getting your ass kicked. Yeah. You know, because 70% of our trades every day were, were bad. You know, so if you have 70% of your trades being wrong all day, and if you're the type of person that learns just to sit on your ass and, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, the world is falling, you'll never be able to do the next trade. Mm. And that's one of the reasons why my son was one of the top lacrosse players on Long Island, because when he was a little kid and everybody would miss the ball, you know, when they would run up to it and go, you know, they shrugged their shoulders and they go, damn it. He wouldn't do that. He'd just roll his shoulder, go back and get the ball, because I taught him at a very early age, you just you just go. Mm. One time in my, when my daughter was like in third grade and the teacher calls me, she goes, what do you do? I'm like, why? She goes, well, I said, sometimes you win and sometimes you lose. I'm like, yeah. She goes, your daughter stood up and said, sometimes you break even and that's a really good day. You know? <laughs> so, so, and then she had me come in and then nobody wanted to ever follow me after taking your dad to work day because I brought in changing jackets. I had the kids up screaming and everything. That's so awesome. it, was, it was crazy stuff. But that was my, that was one of my biggest lows trading. The other biggest low was on 9-11. Mm. Um, I'll never forget, I parked in the South Tower. I had made a trader's breakfast club. I made a deal with Windows of the World. It was $800 for the year. You got free breakfast every day there. Mm. And all the sake tasting, a special seat. They had this, the greatest bar on earth back then and all this cool stuff. Mm. I was going to the elevator and the express elevator that wasn't there or something was going on. And they told me I had to take the local. And I'm luckily very lazy. And I said, I'm not taking a local because you got to go up to 56, cross over, go up, a total pain in the butt. Mm -hmm. I went down across the street, sat in my building, the first plane hit. Wow. Everybody from breakfast was gone. <sighs> you know, so I lost a lot of people. And what people don't know, one of the biggest secrets about 9-11 is that that night, Vinnie Viola, who's a close friend of mine and who's chairman of the exchange at the time, Army, uh, West Point grad, you know, Army Ranger Colonel, and chairman of our exchange gets a call from the White House. Say, listen, world oil prices are going crazy. You guys gotta get up and running. So uh, one of my partners, Richie Schaefer, came and he's very sick because of it now, went down to see if the exchange was still standing on that night, which it was. Now you have to remember, we were on the west side, the stock market was on the east side, so the stock market right. never got hit. The buildings fell into us. And we were there the next day, basically, about a day and a half later. And we were having um, generators flown in. You know, he got full, uh, everything from the U.S. government that we ever needed, because I was on the board there. And so just the board members were wow. there. And we were laying lines. We were looking for new sites. Every board member had a different role. And Vinny ran this like a military operation. So I got to see leadership under pressure. Wow. But the interesting thing is that we were open th that next Tuesday. We were the first exchange to open. And we were the only building in the official Ground Zero open for three months secretly. And we brought, a, at first, we brought a 1,000 people in a day by boat up the wall into the building, put a three-foot perimeter around the building that nobody else was uh, allowed to leave. I was lucky and unlucky that I had one of the five passes from the mayor to go up to the site, which, I, looking back, I, I would have rather not because I've had some health issues from all mm. the smoke and everything. But we kept the exchange up and going wow. you know, for three months, quietly. You know, and uh, crazy times. And that, knowing that you have your your friends next door that have died mm. and having to still step into the pit and know that you have to do what you have to do. And my biggest low was getting my friends out of their trading positions for them because they were they just weren't here anymore. Ugh. And it was amazing because no matter what the trade was, when you went around the ring saying, listen, this is XYZ's guy, you know, the market said, I need you to buy him at a half. And let's say at 50, the broker would go, I'll buy him at 80. You know, they just made sure that their families wow. was set. And we, we brought in millions of dollars for the family. So that was really the lowest point, you know, on, on the floor. Oh, my you know, God. It didn't, get, it didn't get much worse than that. That's unbelievable, man. I can't, ima I can't imagine being there. I can't imagine, you know, going through that. It, it, that's just, oof, that hits me, man. Well, we were so close. You walked out, you could literally feel the heat of the building. You could see the people falling. Um, and coming back with the smell and, and knowing what was going on, but making sure that we were here to service our country and, and to honor the people that we lost really was the most important thing. Yeah. And, and, and Vinny did an amazing job getting everybody together and getting us up and going. It, it, I'm, I just, I'm curious, uh, why, did, uh, why, did, why did he have to get the, it up and running and why there? Like, oh, why, sure. What was the reasoning? This, is, this <laughs> shows our age difference, right? Yeah. There was no backup exchange at the time. There was no electronic trading. The internet was just new. 
you know, it was still, it was 01. People don't realize it wasn't yeah. as robust as now. We actually had a jury rig our system. We had a closed end system that was just open at night to get on the internet that day. And it's, it's actually an interesting story because I was standing there and I was, I never thought that crude oil, because the way it was traded, could handle online trading because it's traded over three or four years. And the S&P is just one month, so it's a little different. So uh, I'll never forget that we turn on the machine during the day for the first time. And Vinny Viola is standing to my right. I have the president of the exchange and me. And I look at this screen and I'm expecting what we call a bid and offer, as big as you can drive a truck through. And it's like two bid four. It's tight, the market's efficient, it's working. And I walked away and I looked at this, and this is a perfect example I talk about, is that two people can look at the same picture and see completely two different things. Mm. So I walk away and say, oh, we're done. You don't need the trading floors. In time, we're going to be done. And Vinny walks away saying, I can make a billion dollars on this and invents Virtue, the largest trading, uh, the largest electronic trading firm in the world, and True. makes $2 billion off wow. it. Wow. And we looked at the exact same screen. So this is what I try to teach people you know, when I talk about seeing three-dimensional. Um, and you have to see everything that's in front of you and not. And back then, I just saw singularly. You know, and with the way that I explain it to the class is I'll take a cup of water and I'll put the water down. And everybody says, half full. Yeah. Like, they're like, what do you mean? I said, what else? They said, well, it's half full. Well, they said, oh, you can say it's half empty. I go, no, there's liquid in there. It's moist. If keep the cup out there. It's going to get moist on the outside. I could take the water. I could put it on the plant. I could drink the water. I could throw the water on the floor. I said, there's 37 different things I can do with this mm -hmm. water. It's not just half full. I go, never look at it that way again. Wow. And all of a sudden, when they understand the concept of three-dimensional thinking, where I learned from looking at that screen and only seeing one point of it, mm -hmm. All of a sudden, these kids start calling me up, and my clients start calling me up because I'm looking at life completely differently now. Mm. I'm looking at it from all different sides. And once you can do that and expand your mind and open your mind, there's a whole new world out there. And the, uh, the possibilities are truly, truly endless. That's, a, that's an amazing perspective, um, an incredible story. And it's interesting because I agree with that, uh, the, having coming at things with so many different angles. And I had a coach years and years and years ago who uh, had a big impact on me. And anytime I had a challenge, I'm like, well, I'm trying to work through this. And he goes, okay, well, what, what's your options? I say, well, these, these are the three ways it could go. And he goes, sure. what else? Right. Fourth. What right. else? Yeah, and right. he would just literally just and, he, bad you, right. and you're like, oh my God, like even, you know, they're bad ideas, but nonetheless, like just getting that perspective of there's a lot of ways that you can solve anything. But you never know. A lot of the <clears> bad <throat> ideas turn out to be in the right idea. Yeah. Okay. But you won't get there unless you bring it through. I always believe in correlation risk. Okay. Mm. Both good and bad. Yep. Right? And I explain about decisions, how we made on the board in IMEX that we didn't realize that 10 correlations down were awful. And some bad ones that we found that the 10 correlations down were absolutely amazing. And we didn't even think about the things that could have happened back then. You know, and as you mature in your thinking thought process and you realize that decisions can be made quickly and efficiently, but they can also be made in a round scope, hmm. your life changes because it's not black and white. Right. You know? And that's the key. It's not gray, it's not black and white. It's like my one of my lawyers. Yeah, it's gray. I'm like, screw gray. You know, it's, it's every color of the rainbow. Mm. And look at it from all different sides. And in, in any business that you're in, in coaching, in business, in sports, in art, in movies, or whatever, it opens up possibilities that you could mm. never have imagined. Where, where, does this, where does this mindset for you come from? I think it came from going through a lot of crap, mm. okay? It's not about my victories. Um, you know, listen, you know, my mom passed away when she was just turned 56, mm. you know, which at the time when I was in my 30s seemed a lot older, but now that I'm 55, it seems not so old, you know? Yeah. And I helped her, my sister helped her, and a, a bunch of us helped her die. She had lung cancer and she didn't smoke. Mm. You know, and I remember looking at her one day and saying, if you need me to take you out, I will. Okay, because she was in so much pain. Oh. And she looked at me, she goes, I love you, but I know how to make a morphine cocktail just in case. You know, and when you face death like that, uh -huh. you know, and I call it being taken out of the matrix, you learn when people have gone through some horrific things. So I went through that first in my 30s. And then I went through 9-11, which is a whole nother area in itself. Mm. And then most recently, about five years ago, I had a the strangest thing happened to me. So I was out, I wore hard contacts, and I was out for dinner, and my contact was bothering me, and I didn't have my rewetting drops in my case. So I take my finger, I put it in a glass of water, I put some drops in my eyes. Turns out I get a massive bacterial infection from the water because I had a cornea ulcer, which I didn't know about from my contact. So I'm in my basement for two months because I can't even take the light from my cell phone. The, the, they thought it was amoebic. They thought it was going to go to the brain. They found that it wasn't, which was good. But they find out that I can't see through the cornea after the infection goes away. So I get a cornea transplant. 
So I take off the shield after the cornea transplant, I take my shower, and I can read a Lubriderm bottle for the first time in 20 years hmm. without a contact, and I am pumped. I am feeling that rush from the wow. training floor. I am so excited. I walk into my closet, I grab a T-shirt, I pull it off the hanger, I pull too hard. The hanger spins oh. around, snaps, and hits me right in the eye. Oh, my God. I grab the T-shirt, I put it against the eye, I scream for help, they get me downstairs, we get to the hospital. They say to me, don't cough, sneeze, or throw up, is it, what do we had an open globe. And so they found my lens in the bathroom the next day, they found the cornea underneath my lid, oh my they God. put it back, and over the last five years, I've had nine retina tears, and I slowly went blind in the right eye. And I've had a tremendous amount of pain over the last four or five years. Every day I have a headache, just depending on where. That's why, you know, the New York headaches are 15, the Florida headaches are four. But what this does is, and I teach people, I said, it takes you out of the matrix. Mm -hmm. And I will meet people that are out of the matrix, and you will connect immediately. And those are the people that have been through some stuff that realize the rest of the stuff just doesn't matter. Yeah. It's like, kids okay? Yeah. Your family healthy? Yeah. You got a roof over your head? Yeah, okay, we can work out the rest. Mm. And the one thing that I've learned about these three events, from my mother passing away, from my friends passing away, from me getting hurt, is I live by the mantra, if it's not fatal, we can figure it out. Mm. So it gives me a much more open view of everything, and I don't get crazy about, you know, my ex-wife used to get nuts. You don't get upset about this. I'm like, why? Mm. I go, it's, it's not important, you know? And some people get a little bit upset with me because I, it's not that I trivialize what they're upset about. I just look at them and I'm like, really? Mm. You know, in the scheme of things, stop it. Wow. You know, and when you, when you can get rid of all that excess crap in your head about what you think should be bothering you, and you get that garbage out, you know what you realize? There's a lot more room in your brain for being constructive mm. and for looking at life for what it really is. You know, you had, your, you had your daughter. Your life changed at that moment. I always used to kid around. You know, if your wife was in front of a freight train, you love her dearly, but you're going to hesitate before you push her away. I don't care what anybody <laughs> says, okay? There's going to be, even if it's a millisecond, right? Your kid's in front of that train, there's yeah. no hesitation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I used to explain, there's love, and you love your wife, and you love your friends, but when your child comes out, there is no greater love. And mm -hmm. as you see her grow, and mm -hmm. I used to watch my son play lacrosse and my daughter with, with her photography, there's no greater pride. I and mean, if you put everything into perspective of what's important, everything else can follow. You know, and I try to also explain that success has nothing to do with the kind of clothes you wear, the car you drive, or how much money you have. I mean, I did a lot of work at West Point. Those guys are the best leaders and most successful I know. There are people that I work with at Junior Achievements, you know, for the young kids down in South Florida. I'm on the board of that. Success beyond belief. I know some very, very wealthy people that are not successful. Mm -hmm. I, I, and they never will be because their definition of success is only based on the dollar. And as I said, I've seen a lot of people die in pain, and I can tell you one thing. Their last, last breath, they're not thinking how much money they they have, right. they're thinking, did I make a difference? Hmm. And that's to me is what success is all about. Man. And anybody can make a difference. Wow, and your stories are unbelievable, man. I mean, it's, uh, it's very touching and- No, uh, thank you. Wow, like incredible, very inspiring in, in, in the perspective too. And, and to be able to, to, to keep your, your head on so straight and to come at these things with just such clarity well, and, and, and look at life as... Well, I will be honest with you. You know, there are times my head's not on so straight. Yeah. And there are times where people won't see me for two or three days because there are times that I wake up in the kind of pain I am from the 9-11 body pain and the frustration from losing the sight. And I'm like, I just can't deal with this today. And you know what I learned? It's okay. Mm. You know, and I, I'll step out for a day or two. Um, and it was weird because... Uh, this guy, Rick Allen, who was a drummer for Depp Leopard, and a friend mm -hmm. of mine is his uh, agent. And I saw him on TV in Florida once, and it changed my life because they said to him, well, how is it that, you know, how does it feel not being able to do what you used to be able to do when you lost your arm? And he goes, what are you talking about? I think about the amazing things I can do with one arm. I don't think about the things I can't do. Oh, man. And all of a sudden, I, it changed my life. So I started wearing my patch more, that, and thanks to Dan Crenshaw, because I, I got his patch maker, so I got the cool patches now. I'm very excited. <laughs> um, actually, at NYU, I put my patch on last night, and they're like, just stay with it all the time. It's going to brand you. I'm still getting used to it. It's my one vanity thing. <laughs> um, but you know what? Sometimes you don't hold it together, mm. and it's okay. Mm. You know, and, you know, as I said, I step out and I kind of don't let see people see. By the end of every day, I'm fried. I'm not going to lie to you. Yeah. You know, the brain, you know, working extra hard. I'm working with a, the Florida Panthers eye doctor. This guy, Dr. Dan, he's brilliant. And he's got a whole thing on the new neuroplasticity of the brain. And he's mm. training athletes 
to be quicker on their feet because of this whole virtual reality and computerized system that they have now uh -huh. that they can make the puck a little slower. He's working with baseball teams. And I said to him, before I met him, there was a time I live in this development in Florida and I never thought I was gonna leave the development again. The anxiety levels were just mm. too much with all the input coming in. Uh, and he trained me on a system and now I'm back in New York and I'm doing things and I'm, I mean, I didn't go to my cousin's wedding. Everybody was pissed at me, but I couldn't deal with it because I had just gone to my, uh, my daughter's graduation in San Diego and I almost had a panic attack through the whole thing because there's too much things going on. Wow. But what you learn is that you take these experiences and whatever experiences you go through life and you have to learn from it. And this came from my third week in Chicago when I was a clerk. So when I graduated Syracuse, I was a clerk for $3.75 an hour as a runner. And I wanted to go to Chicago because my father was a big trader in New York. So I sneak into Chicago, I got this job as a runner, and this old guy, I mean, maybe he wasn't as old as I thought he was because I was <laughs> in my 20s, but he looked like Rip Van Winkle. I mean, crazy, Great, you know, red beard, red hair, looked like, you know, looked like a guy that smoked for 80 years and it took its toll. And he comes over to me and he goes, kid. I'm like, yeah. He goes, I know who you are. I'm like, really? He's like, yeah, you're Greenberg's kid. I'm like, oh, shit. You know, I'm like, damn. He goes, let me tell you something. He goes, I have been working here for 30 years. I'm never going to get into the pit. He goes, you're going to have the opportunity to get into the pit, so let me give you some advice. He goes, learn something every day. Mm. He goes, learn how people walk. Are they running to the pit? Are they walking to the pit? Look at the broker's face. Does the broker raise the eyebrow? Does the broker start sweating? Does the broker breathe in? Because you have to breathe in for a sell order. You don't need to breathe in for a buy order. Watch the body language. See if the broker's talking to some girl. Is he sleeping with her? What's going on? Learn how the clock moves. Learn the cadence of the room. He goes, if you do that, you'll be a good pit trader because when you go in and they find out who you are, they are going to gun for you. Mm. He goes, and you are not going to have it easy. And he goes, and if you can be better than everybody else because you're always absorbing this information, he goes, you're going to make it, and that's how you're going to make this thing. And i got to tell you something. That moment in time, I call them time-life moments in my classes, that when a, when a moment in time shifts your timeline, either left or right, good or bad, if I could find that guy again, I would do anything I could for him mm. because he put me on the road to everywhere that I go, I take something out of I mean, if I'm in an airport, I'm taking something out of. If I'm walking down the street, I went back down to Wall Street. I haven't been down here in a while, watching the people, you know, watching the tourists, watching mm -hmm. everything. But if you're always connected, it gets yeah. exhausting by the end of the day. But sure. if you're always connected, you're always ready to jump. And that's what being on the floor was like because mm -hmm. we had all that input coming in, and we had to be able to go from zero to sixty in two point two seconds. And it helped me throughout my entire life. That's awesome, man. That's I love that. <clears throat> um. You, you talk about, you know, the, the, every, anyone's last breath is not how much money did I make or have. It's, it's what impact did I have. What impact, I mean, you, you, you already obviously have had a massive impact on many people and you already are. But what impact do you want to, uh, you know, give to people the most? Like what's important for you for people to take away from your experiences in life? I think people, what I've been doing, I've been doing a lot of mentoring, you know, down in junior achievements in Southern Florida. It's the largest junior achievements in the country and it's a lot of the underprivileged kids of Broward County. Mm. And when I talk to these kids and they say, well, I don't have a father and it's so nice to have your guidance. Um, and, uh, and those kids can't afford it, you know. So what I do is I, they say, well, how can we repay you? And I said, I'll make you a deal. And they're like, yeah. I said, when you're 70, tell your grandkids that somebody walked into your life and made a difference. I mm -hmm. said, the one thing that I know is that after watching my mother die, my friends, I don't know how long I'm going to be here. You know, yeah. I've got my own health issues that I deal with, you know, from 9-11. But I want to know that my legacy is intact. And my legacy is to be remembered and I made a difference. So, you know, the way that I do it is simply by trying to, you know, as I talked about, we have all these people out on the internet now. And some of them are great. Some of them aren't so good. Some of them are very loud in your, in your face. And yeah. some of them are very spiritual. I'm just trying to be the guy, like when I, I would be on CNBC and they would just say to me, it's so great, you're just educating the viewers. I have nothing to prove. Yeah. I went out with somebody the other night and they, there's this show called Lost that I used to watch for years. And at the end, there was this one guy, Desmond, okay? And I really focused on Desmond because he kind of just had it. He just kind of knew that, you know what? Everything's gonna be okay. We always say, oh, it's gonna be okay, brother, you know? And I wanna be Desmond, mm. you know? I wanna be the guy that's at the table because I was the nut guy back in my 20s and 30s and 40s. I mean, I went out to lunch with somebody the other day and she said to me, your transformation in the last 10 years to watch where you were mm. being this cocky little 40 year old it was one of the most powerful people in my business, had made a lot of money, had a lot of power, was executive member of the largest exchange in the world at 40, 
you know, to this guy now that's, you know, I'm going to be turning 55 next week. And I'm like, you know what? That was great. Don't get me wrong. But let's spread a message and let's spread a message that everybody can understand, no matter if you're worth 10 million, 50 million, 100 million. I mean, I have friends that are worth literally 2.6 billion. And I have friends that live from paycheck to paycheck. And I treat everybody the same way. Mm -hmm. You know, I always explain it to my classes. And I had them do this last week. I had them go throughout the school. And I go, I want you to go to the person that's selling the, you know, the candy and selling this. Find out something about them. Hmm. Be, they need to be seen. You need to always see everybody. So what I always do is, you know, I just came from the coffee truck on Wall Street. And every time that I'm in New York, I go, I stand by the coffee truck to watch this guy. Because he's the happiest guy I've ever seen. Hmm. You know, and I found out a little bit more about him. He had cancer. He had this. Wow. He had, I spoke to him today. And it's like he's out of the matrix. But you know what? He's like, why would somebody like you come talk to me? I said, why wouldn't I? Hmm. You know, and what people have to understand is that and the message I'm getting across to people is everybody needs to be seen. And where I learned this, believe it or not, was a movie Avatar. <laughs> when they said, I see you, and I was like, that's the problem with the world. Wow. Nobody sees anybody anymore. They yeah. got their head in their phones. I have this thing in my class, get your head out of your phone. They're all so self-absorbed or whatever. A simple going to a cash out person, a cash register person, and how's your day going? And they look at me like, what? I'm like, you yeah, know, you okay? You know, and they're just so shocked that people talk to them. And mm -hmm. if more and more people do that, I just think it'll be going back to a better world, to a day that everybody was just like, I mean, especially some of the younger kids that really treat these people like they're, you know, they're second class citizens. And yeah. I'm the first one to look at somebody and go, what have you done? You know, uh, and I'm very critical on that because everybody to me is equal. You know, it doesn't matter who, what, where. I've been around some of those famous people in the world, some of the richest people in the world. I, I just don't care, yep. you know, because at the end of the day, it just doesn't matter, mm -hmm. you know, and I kind of take them off their high horse once in a while um, because I'd much rather spend, I, I'm the guy that's hanging out in the kitchen at these affairs, talking mm -hmm. to the guys that are in the back, you know, the kitchen or the valet guys or whatever, because I'm still a Rockwell Center kid at heart from the South Shore of Long Island that just enjoyed being, making bagels in the morning when I used to work in my grandfather's bagel store when I was 12. Mm. So and that's what's all, that, that to me what it's about. I love it, man. I, I agree. I, I think there's, everyone has a story. Everybody ha you can learn something from everybody, everything, every interaction. And sometimes the, you know, where we least expect it, where we're least paying attention to is really where we can learn the most or even the opportunities that we're looking for is where we're not. Well, you said the key thing, everyone's got a story. Like somebody yeah. made a comment about my weight online, okay? And I gained 40 pounds after my accident, okay, because the pain level is incredible. Food became my drug, you know. Yep. I couldn't work out because I couldn't get up and going because I'm off balance or whatever. Uh, I was always afraid of falling and everything else. And I go, you don't know my story. So, you know, I tell people before you criticize somebody yeah. or before you make a comment, you don't know what they've been through. You, you know, I was with, um, you know, I go down to this place called the bio station now. I get these uh, B12, you know, things. And mm -hmm. nicest woman in the world, she says to me, listen, I have to leave. You know, I'm like, why? She goes, well, my twin sister's sick in the middle of the country. I'm going to go help her out. You don't know what's going on in no. everybody's life. And for people to jump on people. And, you know, it's funny. When I closed the trading floor, I made a speech when we sold the building. And I said to all the traders, I got them around. I go, you know, when we rip somebody apart, we had to do it face to face. Now, on the trading floor, if you punch somebody, it was a $5,000 fine and a three-day suspension. And we had a floor committee. It was a policing committee. And let me tell you something. There were times people did the math, and it was worth it. Okay. <laughs> wait, this is right. a thing? Like, no, this like, is a thing on the floor. I mean, wait, is this trading or a hockey match? No, like, this is trading. No, th things what? were going crazy back then. So I'll, th I'll give you one story. There was this, <laughs> there was this kid that's the, the guy that's the next to me. I just beat him on the board of the exchange. And he was an ex linebacker from Penn State from years mm -hmm. back. And I needed to get to a trade. And by accident, I pushed him to the side and I went, buy him. And I looked down and he had fallen three steps and hit his head on the rail. Oh. And they have got him. They're holding him back. He is bright red. He's calling my mother everybody name, every, every name in the book. They're holding me back. I'm calling him every name. But we are just going at it. And I say to the guys behind me, go, do me a favor. Like, what? I go, don't let me go. You know? And they're like, why? I said, because I didn't get anywhere close. He's going to kick my ass. <laughs> I said, but we got to make this look good. You know? So what happens is we get a $2,000 fine. Fine. We don't hit each other. We get thrown off the trading floor. And at that time, I was, a, I was a board member. I said to my friend, I go, I'm not leaving. So one of the top board members came over and goes, David, it's not going to look good tomorrow. It says, Wall Street Journal, New York board member gets taken off by New York police off the trading floor. He goes, I will call the police if you don't walk off this floor. Wow. So I looked at him and go, Richie, you know what I'm going to do? He's like, what? I said, I'm going to walk off this floor. <laughs> so this guy, Brian, and I, who I had the fight with, and this is also what I teach in my classes, we walk off the trading floor. And by the time we hit the doors, we're like, okay, where do you want to go for coffee? He's like, I don't know. We hung out for the rest of the day. So 
what the greatest thing about the trade floor is you had these fights, verbal fights, that were literally like, if you were in any other co company, it would be like outstanding. You know, you'd be thrown out. But at the end of the day, it didn't matter because mm -hmm. people knew that we had the fights. So there was tension there. People trained their own money. The numbers were flying around. were crazy. So what I do with my clients and with my classes, I tell them, I want to see you argue with me on a polarizing issue. I had people that were for Hillary and for Trump battle each other out. Okay, but, and this is the key, they would walk out of the room respecting that each one had the right to their opinion and they could agree to disagree and then I'd make them go for coffee. Wow. Okay, because I said, what's happening, like all my classes said, be the people at Thanksgiving when everybody's bitching and moaning and yelling, don't say anything for a while. And then when it comes down and say, okay guys, can we look at it this way? Because my theory is nobody's a thousand percent right, nobody's yeah. a thousand percent wrong. Right. And that's the problem today, you yep. know, is that everybody's polarized. So I'm like, you can't find one thing that you might agree with Trump and you can't find one thing. And also, the greatest thing that ever happened to me was when I was called out in a board meeting by this guy, Vinny. And we were, you know, at that point, we were still competitors, but he was chairman. And we had 24 people around the board and we had 25 senior staff. And I forgot that it was a during the day board meeting because normally they were at night. So I made this comment, I go, you know what? A lot of traders think this way. And he just, he just it was like a, like a line drive coming over to play for him. So he looked at his watch, because he always was Daytona, and I, which I got years ago because I wanted to be like him. And he looks at me and goes, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of traders feel this way. I'm like, yeah, he looks at his watch again. He goes, good, go downstairs and get three. Wow. And I was like, what? And he goes, we'll wait. Oh, and he man. went silent, he didn't speak again. And I had, to, I had to eat it. I'm like, you know, we'll, we'll talk about it afterwards. And he came up to me afterwards. <laughs> and he put his arm around me. And that's where he started really mentoring me. And he goes, David, you will never open up your mouth again for the rest of your life unless you can back it up. And I'm like, you know, Vinny, you're right. And from that day, I have never made a comment about anything. Mm. My golf score, which is awful, <laughs> but anything without knowing that I can back it up with facts and it's real. And I taught my kids how to do that. And I taught them how to call people out nicely. I said, but if you can be accountable for everything you say, you're not going to you know, say, like, people would say, well, Hillary is a crook. And I'm not saying she was or she wasn't. But I'm like, okay, so give me two things or one thing that you know that she did illegally. And oh, well, they say so. You know, or Donald mm. Trump did this. I'm like, oh, and I'd call him. So I'd do both sides. I'm a full independent. Yep. So I'm as independent as they come because I both vote for both sides. But what I try to explain to people is that stop with the grandiose comments. Yep. Stop it because you're going to have me called out by me every time. Mm. You know, and you know what? I have no problem if somebody calls me out because somebody said, well, what about if I ask you about this? Like, Go ahead. You know, I have nothing to hide. And to be in a position in life and has nothing to do about money. It's all about mindset. It took me a long time to get here. To be comfortable enough with who you are to literally not give a crap about, and I'm not saying in a mean way, what people think, not in an yeah. arrogant way, but yeah. say, listen, you don't agree with me. Okay. Okay. <laughs> right. I'm going to lose sleep over it. You know, I mean, somebody says to me, doesn't upset that, and this guy was a much more powerful and brighter guy and wealthier guy than me. And he's like, oh, he doesn't agree with you. Well, he's got the right to. And if people can understand that in their personal lives and in their business lives, it, it will make their lives just much better. You know, because the polarizing this thing that's going mm -hmm. on. So going back, I'm sorry, going back to the story about me closing the floor. Yeah. Was I said, we said it to their faces. We didn't hide behind a Twitter rant. And we yeah. didn't hide behind Facebook. And, and we didn't hide behind all these things that are going on where the society has gotten meaner mm. because you have now the mob mentality yep. without having to put a mob together. You hide behind it. Mm-hmm. You know, it used to be that everybody, you know, the old days, you know, Frankenstein, they had to get the mob together to go storm the castle, right? Now they storm the castle by, their t by, by writing stuff and they never have to face anybody. Yep. So I look at people like, listen, if you can't say this face to face to somebody without having to worry about getting, you know, nailed, then don't bother saying it. How, you said something that was interesting to me. How, you said you teach people how to disagree with people the right way. Right. How do you do that? Just to understand that it's okay for people to have a difference of opinion and it don't take it personally. You know, just because you think what, what happened to me very early on when I was younger, I used to get angry. Well, how could they not agree with me? You know, and it, I took it as an insult. Yeah. You know, and I was with somebody that every time I had an opinion, she got, she was insulted because I didn't agree with her. And I kept looking at her and I go, what does my opinion and you not agreeing with your opinion, it doesn't make you, well, you think I'm stupid. You think I'm, I'm like, no, I don't. I just don't agree with you. And once I explained to people that if somebody's on the other side of the table, and they're giving you a good argument why they don't agree with you. Okay, that's yeah. great. And if they're giving you a bad argument, that's even better. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, why have 
Why have the fight? Mm. You know, it's just there are people that you have to learn, learn to walk away from. There's, there's nothing I can say that if, I, if you were so convinced that this cup of water, you know, was blue, and after a while, I got to say, this is just no point. Right. You, know, and you want to think it's blue? Good. Right. You go home, you think it's blue. <laughs> doesn't affect my life at the end mm. of the day. Right. So when I talk to people and I would teach people about conflict resolution, and, and listen, I had a huge temper, and sometimes I still do. As a trader, you can go to zero to 60, Literally, parabol yeah. parabolically, both in your emotions and in your fights. It's not good to be when I'm in a fight with somebody. But we also go from zero to 60, from 60 to zero in two seconds. Mm -hmm. And in relationships, that was a little tough, you know, yeah. during my marriage because she, I would say, I, I just, I'd lose it sometimes, okay? And then I'd just go, so you want to go for dinner? <laughs> She's like, well, what after that? I'm like, what do you mean it's over? Mm -hmm. You know, so it's very hard to live with some of the ex-traders because yeah. – the rest of the world didn't look at life. And, and what I've also tried is that I've realized that our way of doing things wasn't, when, when we stopped being on the floor, it didn't translate well sometimes in the mm -hmm. real world. So I had a, and I'm still working on it, changing that whole thing. Mm -hmm. But people have got to learn. Everybody has the right to their opinion. It's not an offense. It's not a knock on them. And it's not an attack. And if you realize it's not an attack, then enjoy the debate. Yep. Whatever happened to a good debate? I right. love a good debate. Yeah. Okay, I love going against somebody and having them go against me. And if they prove me wrong, I'll be the first to look at them and go, you know, I never thought about it this way. And that's the thing you have to talk about, too. When people say to you something, don't just say it's wrong. That drives me crazy. What I always say is, like, I can understand how you see it that way, but I just don't agree with you, and let me tell you why. Mm -hmm. That's yep. saying that you think they're wrong, but that's not a personal attack on them. Because right. I don't care who you are, including me. Nobody wants to hear you know, wrong, I mean, yeah. you're wrong. I used to be with somebody, yeah, you're wrong. Why? Because you are. You know, and just dr used to drive me crazy. Yep. You know, I'm like, okay, I'm okay with being wrong, but just tell me why. Yep. But people that can't back up why they think you're wrong. There's no value. There's no value. There's no value. Right? So, don't, gonna, yeah. so don't you're let gonna it. change anybody's mind by just telling them they're yeah, wrong. So don't get it. <laughs> it's back to those things. Don't let it get to you. What's the point? Yep. You know, don't waste your time mm -hmm. on BS that you have no control over. And that's what stepping out of the matrix is all about, mm -hmm. is seeing what's truly important. And it comes right down to it that, listen, when you're sick and when you're in pain and with the things, those things, you know, there are people that are really, really hurting in life. Yeah. And that when you see somebody like that, you know, I just, um, before my meeting, before I was over, I saw some of the people on the street. So I went in and I bought them a bunch of pastry. They literally... The ironic thing, two ironic things I saw today was they were sitting at a Dina DeLuca starving and he had all the people with all the food in there. So I went on and bought some food and gave it to them. The other thing I thought was hysterical was outside this building that you have the coffee truck in front of Starbucks. Okay? Yeah. You know, and I'm like, this guy's still making a living in front uh -huh. of Starbucks because he realized that you, know, you can get a good cup of coffee for $1.50. Sure. You know, so, but you have to look at all these things in life but notice them all mm -hmm. you know, and, and act on them. And then you, know, you have a very interesting life. That's awesome. And David, let my last question for you is, is you're, as you're mentoring, teaching, and, and doing business with all these, all these people and you have such an amazing perspective, is there one main thing that, that's common to most people that you feel everyone needs to hear? Yes. Everybody feels they need to be right. Mm. I made more money being wrong. Mm. I knew when I was, I didn't know when I was always right, but I knew when I was wrong. Okay. And if people stop trying to just feel they have to be right all the time, what I try to explain is that in the military, when we learned, when we were down, uh, I think I mentioned, or I might not have, I was one of 17 traders that they brought down to Quantico mm -hmm. to find out how we think and how we thought so fast without a chain of command. So if the chain of command was ever broken, that they took some of our techniques and, and, and did that. But there was one guy that told me it was brilliant. He says, David, I don't like, I don't like to quit. You know, because we literally, we got to do everything. There was wild. They put us in the barracks. They gave That's us awesome. uniforms. They woke us up at 4.30 in the morning with a garbage can. They let us fire everything. That was one, that was a highlight, right? <laughs> he says, but I said, I don't want to quit because it was something that I, I just couldn't do. I was just physically, I couldn't do it. He's like, David, there's a big difference between quitting and a strategic retreat. Oh. He goes, people need to learn that it's okay to pivot and that it's not quitting. And people, especially entrepreneurs, what they need to know yeah. is that just sometimes the business is not working. It's not a good idea. You thought it was a good idea. Yeah. You know, and going against that, the, the one thing that I teach and I talk to everybody about, and my father instilled this to me when I was younger, when I was under a lot of pressure, and he said, looked at me and says, David, even the president's got a cabinet of advisors. So I changed that around a little bit. And I tell people is that you have to have a Knights of your round table. You have to have a group of people, or what I call with the girls now, Knightesses, have Knights and Knightesses. But you have to have, have a group of people that you trust that can be your confidants 
that will tell you like it is. And I have a great night of my nights around my round table. Obviously, my son and daughter are always been my father are permanent members and my sister. But there will be people that go in and out of that. But the key thing is you have to have certain members. One, I have my friend Bobby that's always like, David, great idea. I love it. Okay. I love him, so he'll always be on it. But I have my friend Stephen and my father and a few other people, and, and now Bobby too, that will look at me and say, what the hell do you think you're doing? Hmm. Because this is a moronic move. Because what I explain to people is that you never have an idea in business or in life and look in the mirror and say, this is an awful idea. I'm going to go do it. Because every one of ideas we think is, is wonderful. And it's good to have your nights at your round table to be able to lo look at you honestly and say, David, we know you well enough. Wrong. Hmm. You know, you have to stop this hmm. now. And there have been times I haven't listened to them. And I've regretted it. Uh, tremendously lost a lot of money you know wow. by not listening to to my group and then all of a sudden I realized that the 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 table of those people around me knew me better sometimes than I knew myself mm. and they're like listen we know you, you're gonna do it this way you, you you type yourself up you think that this is the right thing you're not gonna listen to us but we're just telling you this and then all of a sudden when they st I noticed in patterns when they started talking to me like that I started pulling back wow. and that was my strategic retreat you know and that's there's nothing wrong with that so the, really the two things is that you can pivot, learn to pivot. You know, as a trader, when we were at a bad trade, we got in, we got out, we got sideways, we got flat. Okay, in trading, everybody thinks there's two positions, long and short, right? But there's a third position I always talk about, it's flat. People are like, well, that's not a position. I'm like, there's no position. I said, but when you don't have a position, you can think clearly. Mm. So when I used to go on TV with, with CNN and CNBC and Fox and everything, and they used to kind of get a little pissed off once in a while that I didn't walk in with a position. Because they would say, where do you think crude's going? And they would say, what's your position? I said, I don't have a position. I think crude's going lower. And so finally they said, why do you never have a position? I said, because if I had a position being long, I'm going to say the market's going up. Because why would I be long if right. I thought the market was going down? And if, there was, if I was short, I wasn't going to say the market was going up. I said, so you're getting a true view of what I really think of the market. Mm. They said, I get flat on purpose so I can see the world for what it is. Uh. And people sometimes need to get flat in life. They need to get everything off their plate and take a breath. You know, and and learn how to recover. As I spoke about, I talk about recovering after getting your ass kicked, and realize it's all going to be okay. Yeah. And when people realize at the end of the day, if your kids are healthy, and you have your health, and you can cover your expenses, it's not about the yachts, and it's not about you know. Because if somebody asks me, he goes, "When is it? When's the number? That's the number." And I always used to say, <clears throat> I have these friends that are billionaires. I said I'd never get there because at X amount I would stop. But you need to realize your goal in life shouldn't be about the number. Your goal in life should be like that guy at the coffee truck, mm -hmm. that he's got an attitude about him, that he gets what life's all about, and he's happy. Yeah. You know, and I know a lot of people that are very unhappy, very wealthy, uh, being very wealthy, and I know a lot of people that don't have a penny to the name that are the happiest people in the world. Yeah. So these entrepreneurs need to understand that, yes, money does buy you things, and it's nice. I'm not saying that it's not, and I've done it. You know, I've got some great stuff over the years. But at the end of the day, if I could have my health back and my eye yeah. back and, you know, a lot of other things, I would give it all up and I would get a street cart right now and mm. sell bagels from it. I'd have no problem with Amazing. that. Amazing. So, uh, so that's, that's basically me in a nutshell. Man, this was incredible. I really appreciate you coming in and sharing your story uh, and your perspective. Pleasure. This was unbelievable. Really. I thank you. You're it a, moved me. No, listen, you got, you got a great thing going on here. You're, you're sending out the right message to the people because you're mixing it up with a lot of different things. Um, and, you know, success is, is at your doorstep and it's already here. And it's wh where you take it and where you want to mold this company. You got a great group here. Uh, smart, young, aggressive. And uh, just enjoy the ride. Mm -hmm. I think part of the thing that I didn't do with my rise to fame, I mean, as, as I said, I was a Syracuse guy with an average that we don't even talk about, right? And, and got to where I got, and sometimes I didn't enjoy the ride, sometimes because mm -hmm. I just was too engulfed in it. Once in a while, take a breath, yep. look around, walk around your office when nobody's here, and go, this is kind of cool, you know? I'm a kid from Riverhead, and look at me now. You know, I'm on Broad Street in the most important street area of, of the world where yeah. all the world's finances mm -hmm. are done. And, uh, and I'm killing it. And enjoy the ride. Because if you don't enjoy the ride, and there are a lot of people that don't, then what's the point of, of getting in the car to begin with? Hmm. Wow. Thank you for that, man. That's that, that, that touched me, man. Thank you that, so much. I really appreciate this. How can, if people want to find you or follow you, how do, how do they do that? On Instagram, I have a new site. 
Um, it's still in the fledgling, but I give a lot of my stuff out. It's um, the David Greenberg because David Greenberg was already taken. So it's the Perfect. David Greenberg, D A V I D G R E E N B E R G. On Twitter, it's at Greenberg Cap. So it's G R E E N B E R G C A P, and GreenbergCapital.com. So awesome. uh, you know, feel free to contact me, DM me, whatever, and be more than happy to talk to you and have a session. I love it. This is awesome. No, thank you. Thank you.